at best, there's only a couple hundred million people in the world that will touch a console on a given generation. Um, but mobile is well north of two billion. And so, you know, you can reach more users. And when you combine those audiences, you get the people that pay the most to right. participate together with the largest possible audience. So I want to start by just recapping the games industry a bit. And uh, thanks for um, my colleague, David, for, for introducing us. Um, so the games industry is, is remarkably huge. It has 2.4 billion people playing games. A lot of that is on mobile, also on PC and console. Um, as David mentioned, it generates $148 billion of revenue every year. It's bigger than music. It's bigger than the box office. And this is an industry that in the last year especially because of the popularity of, of Fortnite, of esports, of you know many of these uh, uh, trends that have really elevated it into the, the the mainstream consciousness, and so we're lucky today to have uh, John Rigatello, um, who's had a front row seat over the last two decades plus in the games industry, first as CEO of EA and now as CEO of Unity, and I want to start with with the question of you know through your time in the games industry. What do you think has been the set of most impactful changes that, that, are, that are driving it forward? So I'd say the first of them is really the, the scaling of the industry driven by technology. So if you go back, I don't know, a decade or two ago, back to 1997, all games were 2D because you couldn't power a 3D game. The, the, the CPUs and GPUs weren't, it wasn't possible. You couldn't do online gaming. You couldn't connect to another live player. And for the most part, you were strapped to a device parked under your TV or a, a large desktop PC. And that's all not true any longer. The, the available compute is up actually many millions of fold to the consumer on a global scale. Networks work better than they've ever worked before. And that which was 2D became 3D. What was sort of non-interactive became interactive. Non-social became social. And in that, you quoted a number, 2.4 billion players. It's actually a lot larger. That Some of that excludes a big chunk of China and India and a couple of the markets. Um, easily north of 3 billion. There are more players in the world than there are TV watchers or music, music listeners on a regular basis. And the gaming industry, as a consequence of that, you know, taking advantage of the technology that fueled its growth, is, has, at least when I got in the industry, was much smaller than either music or TV. And now it's larger than the combination of the two. So it's been an amazing transformation. If you try to create a frame, a picture, in a traditional tool from an Adobe or an Autodesk or Pixar's Render Man, it might take an hour, a day, or a week to actually produce that frame based on the input. When you're playing a video game, whether it's on your phone or you're playing on a console and you hit the X button or the forward button, you're creating a frame that's never been seen by another human being on this planet in a 60th of a second. That level of performance is astonishing, and it's starting to affect industries well beyond the game industry. It's the future for how films are gonna be made. It's the future for so many other industries. We work in, you know, in architecture, engineering, manufacturing, in terms of sim biz stuff. And I can give you another dozen industries that are changing the way they operate. So to me, it's been fun to watch the game industry driven by technology eclipse that which we used to look up to. And then it's been fun to watch our technology be adopted by industry after industry to be the new standard for them. Right, and 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 that is that coevolution of you know the upgrading of the content as well as the technology. It's this is a good intro into into your current company, Unity, um, which sits at at the center of of much of the games ecosystem. Tell the audience what what is Unity and why is it important. So for a lot of folks, this is a complicated answer, and I apologize for that. So if you go back in history to somebody wanted to make a game, they'd have to hire an awful lot of engineers because when you're going to make something that's going to be interactive, it's got to have a system for rendering pixels on a big screen. It's got to have a system for animation. It's got to have a system for processing sound. It's got to have a system for bouncing light around. It's got to have a system for basic UI and UX. It's got to have a physics for humans, but physics to bounce a ball on the ground. And it's got to have so many of those other systems. So what Unity does 
is we change the game for people that are trying to make interactive experiences. And we create a bed, an underlying technology base, that allows all of those things to happen instantly and easily without having to write the code for it. So you can just focus on the content. The second thing we do is when we first started, you still had to write the code for the game, but you got these components written. We changed over a decade ago to a solution where you use an editor, like you were an Excel spreadsheet. You pull down, you click on something to create your content. You, know, you write some scripting language. You're primarily using an editor to create your content. And then what Unity does is we composite the code for over 30 platforms, from Oculus to HoloLens, Android to iOS, Xbox to PC to Mac. So we actually create the code. So a, a content creator doesn't need to do this over and over and over and over again. So we provide the underlying technology. And today, we also provide the system that creates the code that vastly accelerates the, the speed with which one can otherwise produce or just reduces the time and lowers the cost. You know, the, we have a clip actually to share and, and to show the audience uh, some of what you're able to, to build with Unity. And, um, you know, I, I would ask the audience to kind of imagine, you know, maybe some of the games that you've played um, as a kid, you know, over the last uh, 20, 30 years, going from Super Mario Brothers and, uh, you know, some of our favorite, favorite games through the years to now what, what you can produce. So maybe we'll play the clip. It's <laughs> great, um, John. Uh, you and I during during the prep, we were talking. You, you had said that uh, to, to watch out for the the simulations of the the cars and the uh, interior architecture, which just looks incredibly photorealistic. In well, that, I think it's actually those particular samples were made with a technology where the individual pixels are exactly as they are in real life. Individual pixels lit and, and drawn in such a way that they are in fact indistinguishable from what it would be if it was film. And what's interesting about that is, you know, the BMW saw up there, for example, um, BMW sent that on to Car and Driver and asked their um, writers and their, their readers to try to figure out which was the real car and which was the, the drawn car, the animated car, the one created in Unity, and they couldn't tell. By the way, no one can. <laughs> and so we're, we're reaching a new place in the world today where, you know, we're gonna conjure up actors from 50 years ago or ones that never existed, or anything that is real or non-real, and mix it together in ways that defy imagination. Absolutely, yeah. And and uh, you know, one of the really interesting things about Unity's sort of early um, formation story is that a lot of its success in the early days started with adoption by indie developers. And, uh, and, and this world of you know, very small studios, maybe just a couple people you know, building games. T talk about that and how that's now scaled into um, you know, AAA studios and, and kind of the larger um, you know, names that the, that the audience would also recognize. So Unity was originally a tool that was, was designed for indies. It, I mean, the company was you know, a couple dozen people. They, they couldn't make a technology that companies 10 times our size or 100 times our size would ultimately adapt for, as a as a foundation for what they would build on. We were the, the pipsqueak on the block, but a lot of indies found our tools super simple, super easy, um, and they could, they could do prototyping and building content in Unity. And, and back in the day, just several, you know, five, six, seven years ago, um, we still had some level of success. About, you know, 20 million times a month, there was still a product downloaded built in Unity. But we had virtually nothing in the top 100, um, actually had nothing in the top 100, um, had very little in the top 500. Occasionally, we'd see something there. Most of our content was in the 5,000 and below ranks. 
And that was still enough to produce 20 million downloads in a month. If you fast forward, we've invested an enormous amount um, in technology. A couple dozen engineers, by way of example, have become 1,700 engineers. And that engineering power shows in the capability set of the product. And today, 20 million is just about three to 3.1 billion every you know, downloads per month in content building Unity. And it's, it occupies a lot of the top slots. So at any given point in time, using mobile as an example, it's not just the top 100 we've cracked, but you know, the fastest growing game in the world today, Call of Duty or products like uh, uh, you know, Mario Kart Tour, Pokemon Go, Honor of Kings, the biggest game in the world these days, which is a 10 cent built game in China. These are beautiful products and they're built in Unity. So we've kind of moved up scale and at the same time, you know, conquered, not conquered, we're, we're beginning to penetrate architecture and engineering and the auto design world and aerospace and other markets where they need extremely, you know, high fidelity tools. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, many of the games that you mentioned are um, on, on mobile and uh, but also are, are on uh, desktop and, and console. And, and this is this very super interesting trend that's that's been emerging over the last couple of years where um, we used to think of all think of games as sort of like primarily, you know, you, you play it on just PC or console or you have, you know, mobile separately. Um, and now at least, the, you know, the, the, the startups that we often meet at Andreessen Horowitz, um, they often come in pitching, you know, cross-platform, multi-platform kind of from, from day one. S say a little bit about, you know, Unity originally started on mobile and, and made this really early investment to go cross-platform. Um, talk about how you think that'll, that'll, that'll affect the industry over time. So just for clarity, when I mentioned Call of Duty, it's the mobile game built in Unity, not the console yes. game. Yep. So still today, I mean, five years ago, 80% plus of the games that were built were built using tools created by the publisher. That's not true any longer. Um, Unity by itself has got over half of all games, two thirds of all AR, VR is built in Unity. Um, and so the the self-made tools from the publishers and developers has receded uh, because frankly, you just get better technology third party today, which is what we've been driving and, and harvesting. Um, but the gaming industry is, is going through a lot of transformation. And one of them is exactly what you described. It used to be you played a game on your PlayStation or your Xbox, you played with other people on your PlayStation or Xbox or PC or Mac um, or on iOS or on Android. And increasingly, um, what we're starting to see is games that are played from all those devices and the game itself is a simulation in the cloud accessed by those various devices. Now, there's some limits to that. Um, if, you know, if you're a Fortnite fan, it's kind of hard to win in mobile when someone else has got a better control system you know, with a controller or a, a PC interface. But that's increasingly an important um, aspect of the game industry is, and they can consequently attract larger and larger audiences. I mean, at best, there's only a couple hundred million people in the world that will touch a console on a given generation. Um, but mobile is well north of two billion. And so, you know, you can reach more users. And when you combine those audiences, you get the people that pay the most to right. participate together with the largest possible audience. Right, yeah, it's really a massive expansion of the addressable market to be able to play a single game across all, all of these different platforms. It is, and, and Unity alone. I mean, when we track all the services we provide, we touch well north of a couple billion users in some monetizable event every month. I mean, it's a, these markets are big. Right. The, the other big change that's happened in the, in the games industry is it seems like we went from a world where people would, you know, buy the $60, you know, Call of Duty, you know, play a campaign, you know, they play for 30 hours, to now all of a sudden you have, you know, Fortnite, League of Legends, you have Minecraft, you have these things that, that are really operated as services. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and people seem to play them for years and years and years. I think League is, you know, now 10 years in. And it's still, you know, growing audiences worldwide, which is which is super fascinating. You know, talk talk about how, how how you view that. Well, first off, a, a huge amount of media. You go back to when um, maybe before you guys can even remember, we bought albums, right? We bought music. There was you know a number of songs on both sides, Sgt. Pepper's, whatever you might have bought when you had to buy vinyl. Then we bought DVDs, and what the quantum that we consumed, the quantum we purchased, was what was efficient to put on a piece of vinyl. And games were the same, same way. We, we, we had floppies and we had CDs and we had DVDs and we had Blu-ray DVDs. The games and experiences got better and they got bigger, 
Um, but increasingly, that's a silly and inefficient way to deliver content. Just why, you know, if you take a look at the television industry, whether it's Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad or you pick your favorite serial television, there's more innovation going on there unrestrained by like the two hour or 90 minutes you can see in a cinema because they can expand it to be a more compelling experience because they're not constrained by the packaging. And in the game industry, um, we're not quite at the point where we've left behind all physical uh, media, but we're close. And um, I, I can't talk about you know, hardware launches that are coming next year that we are preparing in engineering and coming the year after that. But increasingly, what we're gonna see is um, just like your music, um, just like the, the, the films you buy, you're not going down, you know, to, you know, some retailer, Walmart, and buying a whole bunch of DVDs. You're not buying right. a whole bunch of video cassettes. And the game industry is doing the same thing. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 you know, with that sort of games as a service approach, the other big thing is it, it just unlocks the ability to, um, to, to, to build multiplayer experiences, to build social experiences. One of the things that you know we've blogged about is sort of the idea that, especially if you're if you're a kid and you're growing up, you're thinking about um, these products as your social network, right? It's sort of like the way that you're hanging out with with your friends. Do you, do you so agree I with think that? I, I totally agree, and I actually think for those of you that aren't serious gamers, um, I think it's an important insight to take home. And I, I hate to credit myself with an important insight to take home, but I'm going to take a <laughs> shot at it. Which is, um, if you go back ten years ago. Um, or, or when I started in the industry, you know, almost a quarter of a century ago, um, games were a tiny fraction of an individual movie's, you know, blockbuster, you know, hit status in the in, in the in, in theatrical. Um, we were selling things that were lucky to hit twenty million dollars in revenue, and we were looking at hundred million, two hundred million dollar revenue streams. Um, my company was smaller than the Rolling Stones when I first got to Electronic Arts. You know, like, the, how is one musical act as important as all that? And they still are important to me. But the, the point that I'm going to try to make is that the reason the game industry kept growing at that 20, 25, 30, 35% compound growth rate is it was different than the other media for exactly the reasons you mentioned. Right. It's, it's where things were, you know, you could... It was the same every time you played it. It's different every time you play it. It's interactive rather than linear. So you're getting a, a, a much more compelling experience. You're playing against other live players, not just against AI. Everything's different. Humans are a much more interesting opponent than the AI that can be driven into the game by some designer. And they're social. And so more than any other media, gaming is the media that takes advantage of the most important technology trends. And now a lot of the contents, there's a lot of AI factors into it, driven by massive data. I can talk more about that if you'd like. Yep. But these, this media is the biggest media in the world today, and it's because it takes advantage of the most important technologies available today to reach and retain an audience. Right. Well, and, and uh, you know, Sitting on on the the tech side of um, you know much of this investing, it's so exciting to see you know caffeine and uh, YouTube and Facebook embracing, especially on the video side, streaming kind of where this where where a lot of this game's content ends up and, and where people end up interacting with it. One piece of what you said kind of that bridges both the the video world as well as you know the 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 idea that you know human opponents are, are more interesting than AI is a, a lot of um, you know, the, the top games franchises are now thinking a lot about esports. They're thinking a lot about teams, they're thinking a lot about that. And, and you know, the easy metaphor is, well, esports is basically just like traditional sports, we're gonna have teams, we're gonna have leagues, we're gonna you know, have some of these uh, different pieces. But say a little bit about like, where maybe some of those metaphors you know, hold true, you know, and, and where maybe, maybe some of that metaphor breaks down. So, um... Let me just start, for those of you who don't know what eSports is. So um, today, um, I believe the single largest category on YouTube is watching people play video games. It's, it's celebrity people playing video games and letting other people watch. Amazon's got a massive business on Twitch, which is allowing you to watch other people play video games. And that may seem a little bit crazy, right? Why would you watch someone else play a video game? But it is a massive medium, and it's a medium that is, an, in and of itself in time, will rival television. 
which is completely crazy from any historical perspective. So there are massive audiences of people watching other people play video games, just like there are massive audiences of people watching people ski at the Olympics or ice skate at the Olympics or play football, like you know yesterday when the 49ers lost. There are massive audiences of people watching other people do challenging things where the most skillful people do things that are beyond our ability. So that's not that strange. Now, where does, you know, I, at least in my opinion, a lot of people want to talk about investing in esports teams or investing in esports and drawing an analogy to investing in, I don't know, the NFL or businesses around the NFL or the NBA, Major League Baseball, FIFA soccer, pick your sport. Um, and I, I, I do think the analogy is a tortured one. Um, no one actually owns the NBA, Major League Baseball, the NFL, soccer. There's a bunch of individual team owners, and they work together under sanction from the government to break down some of the anti-competitive rules that would otherwise preclude them from cooperating with one another. And they have an exemption in the United States from Congress to do just that, to create leagues where they can co collaborate, compete, cooperate, um, again, against traditional antitrust rules. But the team owners are the league. The team owners own the teams. What's different about eSports is Tencent, or Riot, owns League of Legends. 100% every last share owned by one company. And they put on massive events. Um, Activision owns all of Call of Duty or Overwatch. Electronic Arts owns all of the FIFA franchise or the Battlefield franchise. And Epic owns all of Fortnite. And so ultimately the economics of eSports is different because it's not an aggregation of teams that make the league, it's the league that owns the teams, completely different. And in this case, the league is Activision, Electronic Arts, Riot, Take-Two, Bethesda, and they completely control how the economic outcomes are gonna end up. So while some teams I think can make money in the moment because they're super talented and super powerful in their moment and in their window, I think the economics will end up being a little bit different because it's, it's not an unfettered competitive marketplace. It's one controlled by an individual capitalist that thinks esports is a marketing program. Right. Well, and, and it's fascinating that, um, you know, the, the recent deal that Ninja got from uh, the, the mixer, you know, side of things, um, you know, huge amount of money much, much higher than any, you know, esports player, right? And it's just because Ninja's like the most entertaining, he has the biggest audience. It'd be the equivalent of if like a, you know, Harlem Globetrotter player were, were better paid than any NBA player, right? It's like super fascinating. Well, and then one thing to look at, if you just want to have some fun, go look at YouTube subscribers. There are individual gamers there that play and package their content and have subscribers. There's a couple of them with over 100 million subscribers. Two thirds to three quarters of what Netflix have in number of subscribers, a single gamer. These guys are doing well. So there's <laughs> no question that there's something about the celebrity here that right. is monetizing better than, I don't know, what Brad Pitt gets in Hollywood. Right, right. No, absolutely. Um, and, and, and you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Tencent um, uh, a, a second ago. You know, wh one of the things when you start to dig into the games industry is how much of it is actually international. Um, you know, the importance of some of these players like, uh, you know, Nexon and, you know, NetEase and Tencent and the list goes on and on and on. How does Unity think about emerging, you know, game markets and the international market? And, you know, what, what do you think we can, we can learn from them? So if you go back 15, 18 years ago, um, China had a very successful business in CD and floppy gaming, so physical media. And probably a surprise to no one, there was a challenge around piracy. And that piracy destroyed the industry, completely destroyed the industry. A similar thing happened in Korea. These markets fell apart because there was no ability to protect intellectual property rights. What rose like a phoenix from the ashes was digital online gaming where you couldn't really pirate it. It was in a server and it required an authentication key and it required a number of technologies to, to access it. And Korea and, and, and China today are two of the three largest markets in the world for games, US being the third. And they are staggering multi-million dollar businesses with high growth rates, but they're all digital. So. You ask how um, I would look at the market globally. You know, for a while, gaming was console, and that was Japan. 
right? That was you know, people like Sony and Nintendo, and it was really centered there. And for the people my age growing up, that's what you watched, who had the better console. It then became a U.S., maybe U.K.-centric business where the, the best game studios, and they became more important than the platforms. They became more important than what a Sega or a Nintendo or Sony or even Xbox could do, was the publishers. That was uh, Electronic Arts and Activision and Take-Two and Ubisoft and some players from Japan like Square and others. And at this point in time, geographies outside of the markets I've just mentioned weren't all that big. And with the rise of digital gaming and the technology innovation that was brought first in Korea and China, some amazing businesses have grown up. Um, you know, Tencent is arguably in the same league, for those of you who aren't as familiar, with a Facebook, a Google, a Microsoft, or an Apple in terms of market cap and market impact and what they do. And they're basically the Netflix of games of China. Now, they've got a lot of other things that you could ascribe to them, but they started as a gaming platform, and a huge portion of what they have is about gaming. Now, there's, they're way more than that now. So they've metastasized in a positive way to create an amazing company, uh, amazing company in China. And they're reaching beyond China in many ways. And today, some of the most important um, developers that are outside of the United States rival the biggest in the U.S. One of them you mentioned, Nexon, um, dual uh, headquartered in Korea and, and Japan, run by a great guy, Owen Mahoney, CEO there. Um, obviously, Tencent is a behemoth unto themselves. Net NetEase in China. Um, NetEase is maybe the equivalent of an Activision in the United States in terms of their impact. Um, but today, um, if you looked at the gaming industry and looking for surging influence, you, you'd have to include China. You'd have to include Korea. You'd still include Japan, uh, northern Western Europe, and the United States. So there, this is, you know... A, a global market. Then you got markets like India, where there's a lot of developers, a lot of content creators, not a lot of consumption yet. Right. Um, and so the markets evolved, but it's now truly a global phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, it, it's fascinating to me also that the um, a lot of what people are so excited about now with you know Fortnite's free to play model and being cross platform, et cetera, um, and, and and kind of building these um, pretty core experiences on on the mobile app. It, you know, these are all ideas that were pioneered in 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 Asia. And then, you know, and, and people were not even sure that it could be executed this way in the United States. It's actually really hard to figure out where the innovation comes from. So not that many industries are truly global. I mean, if you think about it, they, they tend to be concentrated in one geography or another. The gaming industry is at least one where, like the most important of the online games, World of Warcraft before that, Ultima Online, were clearly pioneered in the West. Yep. Um, if you try to figure out where Fortnite came from, it's a, it's a Korean company that created a thing called PUBG, which is um, a, you know, a, a very similar product yep. and has a massive audience in, yeah, this in Asia. Yeah, this blue hole. Right. And so, good call. Um, you never know how much your partners at Andreessen know about. <laughs> and, but then when you dig into it, I can't think of many industries that has as much innovation coming from as many different places. Um, next on the company you mentioned probably does the best job of husbanding the, the value of players looking at the long-term lifetime value of an individual player. They're probably the premier company at managing that particular aspect. Um, NetEase has got some of the most important games in the world. Tencent created, I think, some weird admixture of if Netflix was a gaming platform and you were to marry it to a social network, then that's what you have in, in, in China. And that may be the future in some significant way in the West. Um, but you've still got the most important triple-A graphic um, compelling content coming out of two West Coast company, Electronic Arts and, and, and Activision, yep. and an East Coast company called Take-Two. Um, you probably heard of their products like Grand Theft Auto. So yep. that's pretty well. You've talked about this kind of like Netflix you know, analogy um, you know, a couple times. And one of the really interesting things that we're, we're starting to see in the market is you have, um, you know, Epic Games, which, which uh, you know, has kicked off a new store, right, for, to actually download games directly. And so they're, they're, they're effectively, you know, publishing these days. You have, um, you know, Valve, which has the, the Steam uh, store to, to let you also download, you know, games there. You also have uh, Stadia. You have, you know, Microsoft also. Obviously, now you can just buy and, you know, download games, um, all that. And, and so you're starting to see all of a sudden a lot of folks you know, putting out money, trying to, to buy exclusives, right? And so, you know, one of the things that, that obviously we've seen with Netflix, Hulu, 
um, you know, in Amazon is how much money they've put into content. And, and do you think that, you know, on one hand, you could say like, okay, look, you know, the fact that Epic is, you know, I've heard numbers as big, you know, for, for like a Borderlands, which is, you know, one of the big franchise games of, you know, a hundred million dollar, you know, guarantee, um, minimum guarantee to, to be listed in, in, the, in the Epic Store. Do you think that these kinds of dollars are here to stay in the games industry and it's just going to keep going? Or is this something that is, you know, kind of a, a, a little blip as people are trying to bootstrap their, 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 their store strategies? The App Store model where you pay to download something, um, runs directly into conflict with the notion we talked about earlier, which is those multi-platform games. So the, you know, the, the idea that a game would be everywhere as opposed to captive on an individual download site like Steam or the Epic Store. And, and I, I admire both, um, you know, Gabe and Tim who run Valve and um, Epic successfully, or super successfully. But I think the future is different than that. Yeah. And I, I think... Um, it's actually hard to come up with an industry with as many well-capitalized companies chasing it as they can. But so first get in your mind that um, the music industry and its, its way of working is transformed fundamentally around Spotify, Pandora, and other music services. Apple and others have them. And you know the, the labels on a relative basis have lost a lot of value. And the consumer relationship is with a platform company. And... Clearly, in the film industry, television and, and theatrical-type content, there's a clear recognition and a lot of money being spent by people like Netflix and Disney and Amazon and others, Apple, that are trying to create a direct relationship to the consumer and disintermediate, at some level, the, the, the producer of the content. And at least in music and in film, um, the distributors, as the old expression, like content is king, but distribution is God. Um, there's this notion that the distribution layer is more valuable, which is why you see so much investment. There's a lot of people believe that the game industry will end up in a somewhat similar way in, in time. What we don't know is some company like Tencent, going to figure out how to get global, because that's what they do in China. Is someone like a Google, Microsoft, et cetera, going to invest enough to become the Netflix of games in the West and maybe challenge Tencent in China? Or like Disney, will companies like Electronic Arts and Activision and Bethesda and Take-Two, Western strongholds for content, will they build that direct-to-consumer relationship? But there's no question there's an enormous amount of value in that direct-consumer relationship. And it is, if you haven't noticed, um, the skirmish is massive and the world's largest companies are chasing it pretty hard. Right, right. Well, and, and, and it's amazing to see, you know, some of the big tech companies also being very interested, you know, with, with uh, Stadia and Well, Stadia's Xbox, from Google, if you don't know. It's yeah, like exactly, streaming right. Service. Yeah. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, cloud gaming, which is, you know, the, the, the whole idea is rather than having, having a console, you can basically just... You know, have a have a controller, and you can you can play anywhere. You can kind of move move from screen to screen. You can do whatever you want on there. Um, and and this is a big push that um, all all these uh, uh, Microsoft and Google are, are. You know, it sort of feels like it's a skirmish on the side of like cloud computing more generally. Um, but but they're putting a ton of money into and and, and uh, you know buying a lot of content, et cetera. Um, talk a little bit about you know how you think. Um, cloud gaming is going to change, you know, both both from a Unity standpoint as as well as from you know kind of the overall industry. Well, I'm going to do a little quick show of hands for people out there. When you guys, when anybody, is there Netflix subscribers out there? All right, most of you, right? So, when you got Netflix, did it really cross your mind, or did it matter to you that it was streaming versus downloading? Big deal, maybe not. So, when when Netflix streams something to you, they they use a technology called a codec, compression, decompression algorithm. They can shrink a movie down to a much, much, much smaller footprint so they can send it compressed on a pipe and then decompress it in your home. And they can buffer in front of that, meaning they can delay it for a quarter of a second, half a second. So it can work well over a network without, you know, the things that happen when you're in a bad phone call and it pops and clicks and slow and you say, what do you say? That doesn't happen. It's a very smooth experience. And they can do that because they can look a frame in advance, 10 frames in advance, 100 frames in advance, 1,000 frames in advance, and re reduce the size of the frame that would need to move by using an algorithm to remove common elements between the first frame, the 10th frame, and the 100th frame, because they know what's coming. In a game, you don't know what's coming. 
So you can't delay it half a second. You can't delay it a quarter of a second or even a tenth of a second because the you you know if I shot you and you don't fall over, that's a problem. If I'm racing around the corner and I pass you and you don't know it, that's a problem. And so the first observation I would make is a lot of game types. We've talked about first-person shooters like Call of Duty. These kinds of products, the consumer would notice anything north of maybe 30 milliseconds. That's not a lot of time. And if you go to your, you know, if you're on Comcast, whatever, you can measure the latency on your network. And there aren't, I'd say in this room, maybe 10 of you would have a consistent network connection that is faster or more, you know, low latency than 30 milliseconds. So one of the issues with gaming is that the gaming industry can't do st streaming exclusively as easily as they can in the movie industry or the music industry because you can't compress it to the same degree and because latency is a controlling factor. So what I expect to happen in gaming won't be so much this is a big um, streaming solution, but people right. are going to end up with different solutions depending on the content type and it'll live behind a brand like a Google or a Microsoft or a Sony or a Netflix. And sometimes they'll stream it and sometimes it'll be a local application on a device that's in your home. If you play Candy Crush, rather than, I mean, why would a network bear the cost of a single player game being delivered at a penny a minute to play it when you can play it for free on your device and the only thing you're burning is your fingers on the screen? In other words, it's free. And so my sense is the gaming industry will form differently around the, different, around the distribution mechanism because of performance issues, because of cost issues, and because just some things don't work. And when you know, you're mentioning these giant esports event, and you'd mentioned the League of Legends a short while ago, I can't remember how many tens of thousands of people they put in a stadium. One of the reasons those competitions are done in a stadium because you want the, the lowest latency possible, which is taking monstrous cables and connecting the computers to one another, <laughs> where there is no over-the-air transmission. There is no going through a head end at a cable operator. So expect the game industry to have a collection of technologies that enable what you're talking about, not just cloud. Um, you're gonna end up with edge of networks, you're gonna have central cloud, you're gonna have on device, and then most, you know, like if you play Call of Duty with your friends online today, typically one of your home consoles or PCs is being used to host that product. You're going to see a blend of things come together. It, it, it'll be very exciting. I mean, I think, you know, to your point, not only are we going to need a lot of technology evolution, but I think people are going to have to innovate on, on the content as well. Um, it, it seems so obvious whenever there's a new, um, you know, new computing platform, Folks are always, you know, they do kind of like the skeuomorphic thing. They just kind of readapt whatever worked in the last thing. But, you know, people have to, you know, I think we will sit back, you know, 10 years from now. And if the whole cloud gaming thing works, it'll be sort of this whole new genres that are, that are unlocked. We, and look, novelists for years have been describing, you know, uh, Neil Stevenson when he wrote Snow Crash. And he's, he's picturing a world where you have a valid life in a digital world. And we've seen every possible indication that's in fact happening. And games are the most compelling place to do that. Um, you can have a permanent house and a piece of digital real estate that feels like home. For a lot of your children, if not some of you here, their digital handle around gaming provides them a level of social status that is actually both exciting and a little bit scary. They're important in that world. Now, look, I... You know, a lot of you, you know, you go to the office, you've got an important job, you are your, what you are at work, go home and you're a dad, you're a mom, you're a brother, you're a sister, you're a child. You have a different social structure that you adapt into and all the esteem that you have in the office is blown away by kids that say daddy, right? Well, in the digital world, people have valid, legitimate perches upon which they sit and live and that's getting ever more important. And gaming is perhaps the most important media for that to take place because they are what they decide to be in that world. And increasingly people are living in that space. Right, right. So, so we spent a lot of today's conversation on, on games, um, but you know, ba back to the clip, uh, you're also doing quite a lot outside of games. Um, and so you, you know, there's, there's work that you're doing in the automotive and architecture side. Um, you know, you're thinking about the, you know, sort of beyond in the entertainment industry. Talk about what Unity is doing outside of games. 
people have been using digital tools for a long time. Um, they use tools like you know, Revit to design a car or a car door or AutoCAD or Photoshop, et cetera. But all these tools you know, grew up in you know, sometimes 30 years ago, 20 years ago, or 10 years ago. And these tools are being used for design. They're being used for lots of different ways. And now we're partnering with these companies. So we can take things that might have taken hours or days to render and do it in a sixtieth of a second. Um, things that were a solo experience as a social experience, things that don't move do move. And that's all, what I, the first question you asked me, that's driven by the ever increasing power of multi-core CPUs, multi-core GPUs, faster network times, faster internet, more bandwidth and things like v, uh, 5G and other technologies. As those things mature, um, industry after industry after industry is going to shift to real-time 3D for content creation and dissemination. I mean, it, it astonishes me that most car configurators in the world today, by way of example, um, they drive, they, they take the 12 colors they make the car and they drive it into a warehouse and they take hundreds of photographs. And when you go through the selection, um, you're picking the one photo from the angle they took it that's based on that description. That's an insanely inefficient thing to do massively so. And um, to render them photorealistic, as we, as we did here with that BMW, is better, faster, cheaper, and more options available to it. And that's a cloud service you know, that we can create or we have created for our customers. And so we, are, you know, we, create, we recently released a product called Unity Reflect. Um, it allows you to look through your Android or um, iOS device for someone on a construction site to hold it up and the architect who might be in a head office 100 or 1,000 miles away to see what he sees about or she sees about what's in the BIM data. Is the pipe really where they say it is? Do I need to move it? And it dramatically shortens the cycle from there's a problem and I need to fix it from something that involved marking up a piece of paper and dropping it in a tube to go to the bottom of a construction site to be couriered or flown to another location to solving these problems in real time in the moment which saves an enormous amount of money. And we're now working with auto industry, aerospace industry, the, you know, things like Ready Player One, the film, I can talk about it, but it's a long discussion. It was produced in, in Unity, the film by Steven Spielberg, or at least Previs was done in Unity. And so there's so many of these industries, they're gonna move from more traditional tools to more advanced tools. And part of the reason is not only is it better, faster, cheaper, but you can apply the new data algorithms around AI and machine learning to these models and vastly improve the outcomes. So, I mean, just in Unity alone, we track about two to two and a half billion users per month. We're able to do so much with AI to understand these products and to create tools for our customers. Um, in a disconnected world, that's not possible. In our world, it's connected and we're revolutionizing one industry after another in terms of how they create and, and, and distribute content. And it's exciting, it's a good time to be here. Yeah. Can you just say as, as a closing question, you know, what, what are you the most excited about in the technology landscape? There's, you know, there's obviously a ton happening in AI, there's a ton you know, still happening in, in AR, VR, you know, there's blockchain, there's, you know, there's a lot of different new things right around the horizon. What, what excites you the most? So one is, a whole bunch of consumer experiences are gonna change because they're real-time 3D. So, look, I don't wanna make a prediction for Netflix, but let's picture um, the content site that you subscribe to for movies and television content. I am certain within the next two to three years, you'll be able to freeze the frame, uh, put on a set of VR or AR glasses or look through your phone and walk into the scene and go anywhere let's say they produced a Godfather movie and it's in 1960 New York. The traffic will be there, the shopkeeps will be there. You'll be able to wander around that world and interact, not just by yourself, but with your friends and their friends. And it can be while the film was taking place or freezing it, just looking at the way it looks right now, we're completely independent of the film. The world will be real. And that is true of industry after industry after industry. And there's no question, if you use the car configurator the way I've described, you're gonna design the car, you're sitting there and you look around, you'll see everything around you exactly as it is, and you go home and hold your phone up and see the car in your garage and decide if that's the one you like, and it'll be the lighting in your garage that's lighting that car, it'll be exactly the way you want it. There's gonna be so many changes in consumer behavior. The second thing that's happening is AI. And so Unity's working on technologies where 
you know, semantic content creation, but you start to draw a river and it finishes itself because it knows that you're drawing a river. You're creating an algorithm for fire or you want to change a sea of redwood trees into a sea of our forest of, of elm trees. That's repetitive work that doesn't have to be repetitive. And using AI, we can change that, dramatically improving the, the creativity, or at least the opportunity for creativity, because the labor can go away in favor of the better idea. Awesome. All right, thank you, John.